one, which is interpreting the transition in Myanmar, and it's chaired by Mr. Kin Mongwin. It, it is an honor for me to chair the very first session of our, meet, uh, of our meeting. And of course, this morning we are very fortunate to, uh, to listen to the you know, inspiring and at the same time illuminating uh, addresses, including by my dear friend, um, uh, Ambassador Chisatri, who gave the keynote address. You know, when I was asked to chair this session, I thought, how should I approach it as a sort of an introduction? Today, let me say, say what I thought about. Today is 20th July. Yesterday, 19th July, was an important, very historic, and for me, in a way, a very inf infamous day. Because it was the day when General Aung San, the founder of our country, and almost his entire cabinet was assassinated. And when we are talking about transition, and when I look at the date and see that it is one day after this, uh, what we call the Martyr's Day, one hypothetical question comes, came to my mind. Because the topic that we are going to uh, discuss today is interpreting the transition of Myanmar. I mentioned the, what happened on July 19, 68 years ago, because if that event, hypothetical thinking, if that event had not happened, the history of our country would have been, I'm sure, quite different. And we will not be today talking about transition to democracy. But history is history, and things happen, happened. We cannot change history. We cannot change events. And as you can see, we, are, we still had not regained independence at that time. We were just in the throes on the verge of getting our independence when our leaders were assassinated. And at, because of that, it also changed the history of our country. To give a very brief and succinct account, following that event, and after our independence in 1948, our country various, uh, passed through various stages of political development. We have a parliamentary democracy from 48 to 62. And from 62 to 74, we have the direct military rule. And then from 74 to 88, we have the one-party socialist government. And in 88, there was the general uprising by the people, leading to the fall of the previous government. But it was replaced by the mil another military government, which lasted until 2011. And it is only the last four years that we are in transition to democracy. We have, in this course of short brief uh, independence period, of course, many issues. And I'm 
let me say that we are in a state of transition to a democratic rule. And as I look forward very much to your presentations, because we have very distinguished presenters with us, Regarding transition, I have only one thought which characterizes the situation. Transitions, I think this was also mentioned by the Ambassador Shizatri this morning, are never easy. They become much more complicated when the country faces different and many issues. But we, at the same time, I would say that we have, of course, many issues and challenges, but the transition has been going on for four and a half years, or uh, four, four years, and I think it is on the whole, not without problems, but still uh, the process is going on. We cannot reach the democratic state. Well, our aim is to uh, have a democratic country, and we cannot reach it overnight, the transition must pass through some challenging times. And therefore, I very much look forward to our, uh, and listening to our presentations today. And I would first like to give the floor to Dr. Sanjay Pulipaka, if I, if I correct, uh, pronounce your name. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, is a consultant at the now I know uh, because they give only the abbreviation here now what is mean by I C R I E R, which is uh, Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. Well, well, one thing that I, Dr. Sanjay and I share is that, like him. I was also a Fulbright scholar, and I am very happy that, that I, I have in my pan, uh, on my panel a Fulbright scholar with me. Uh, he has been closely following uh, the developments in our nations, politically the, the political developments and the political transition, and also he has taken and conducted research on the North East India, which is our bordering uh, area. So with these few words, I would now like to give it the floor to Dr. Sanchi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me at the outset uh, thank uh, Nias for organizing this wonderful conference, specifically Dr. Mayal and his other colleagues for putting together a wonderful panel of speakers, experts, and academicians and policy makers. Uh, absolutely uh, delighted with the scale of this conference spread over three days. Uh, and uh, I see some friends here, and uh, uh, it's uh, sad that uh, Dr. Mayal is sick today and he cannot join us. Uh, and uh, uh, I see a couple of friends here, and uh, Excellency, uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction. And uh, let, me at the, uh, let me also congratulate your country for the amount of progress you have made in the political transition in the last four years. Uh, while political transition in different parts of the world are falling apart, uh, Myanmar has stayed the course. Yes, there may be some disappointments, but overall the thrust of uh, the political movement in Myanmar has been positive. Uh, having said that, uh, my presentation today will focus on uh, Tatmadaw changing internal dynamics uh, uh, in, in Myanmar. Now, 
uh, any regime for to be stable would, would like to be stable it requires both consent and coercion right uh, it, it, it cannot merely run on coercion uh, every regime will try to generate consent it will try to validate its presence now if Myanmar had sustained military rule what was it that it was uh, what were the mechanics through which it was trying to validate its rule uh, the Tatmadaw or the military as it's called in Myanmar uh, sought to validate its role by deploying historical memory tapping into anxieties and sometimes modulated uh, indulging in modulated representative politics. So what is the historical memory that Myanmar military, the Tatmadaw, constantly uh, uh, seeks into? Uh, one, that it is, uh, it was formed in 1941. It has been at the forefront of fighting not only British colonialism but also Japanese occupation. And most importantly, it is the only institution that played a significant role in Burmese uh, independence. So therefore, Myanmar military claims uh, a historical memory that it is one of those few institutions which has always played a seminal role in the politics of Myanmar leading to independence. Now there is an element of politics of anxiety in Myanmar also that Myanmar military taps into. This was the board that used to be there close to Shwedagong Pagoda and between Shwedagong Pagoda and Nong Song Suchi's residence. Now reportedly it has been demolished. The last time I went there it was not there. And if you see what, what does it say? It, 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 it gives you a lot of anxiety that was there. Oppose those external elements acting as stooges. Oppose those trying to jeopardize stability of the state. Oppose foreign nations interfering in internal politics. Uh, crush all internal and external destructive elements. Now uh, we may find it a little odd but the question that we need to ask is where did this anxiety come from and how did it come? And why is military constantly reinforcing this and it is one of the mechanisms through which it validates its rule by playing on this anxiety and what is that anxiety one B Myanmar experienced not only British colonialism like we in India did but it also uh, experienced Japanese sharp edges of Japanese occupation simultaneously in short spans of time uh, Myanmar experienced both uh, British colonialism followed by Japanese occupation and then British come back again and you get independence so the change of scale of political changes that Myanmar Myanmar witnessed in a very short span of time was phenomenal. As a consequence, there is this always anxiety about foreigners coming in and taking country. So there is an element of anxiety. And then uh, Myanmar at the time of independence, when China went communist, the Kuomintang forces moved from China, some of them into uh, uh, Myanmar and settled in Shan states and bordering regions and started using Myanmar as a launch pad uh, to attack the Chinese forces in, Myan in, in Yunnan and other provinces without the consent of then infant republic of Myanmar. Obviously, uh, it will generate anxieties when some foreign forces are using you as a launch pad then uh, it generates certain element of anxiety then Myanmar experienced uh, large-scale insurgencies that we have uh, that uh, I mean l I mean, you cannot imagine the scale of uh, insurgencies it, it experienced. It experienced communist insurgency. It experienced multiple ethnic insurgencies. There were phases in Myanmar history during the early years of independence when the writ of the Myanmar government, the Yangon government, was often confined to the Yangon. And Myanmar military slowly pushed and pushed back these insurgent groups and asserted its control. So therefore, it is through these mechanisms, uh, uh, because of these anxieties, the Myanmar uh, military claims that it has to play a positive role because it has been instrumental in combating these insurgencies. So therefore if you see uh, 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 in uh, the Tatmadaw's doctrine three co causes or uh, three important national causes or three important national uh, issues that it, it always talks about is non-disintegration of the union, non-disintegration of national solidarity and perpetuation of national sovereignty. If you see the language it is we should not disintegrate. It's, it's, a, it's a very anxious language that is being deployed. So it is these anxieties that have, uh, uh, by deploying these anxieties or tapping into these ang anxieties, the Tatmadaw has sought to validate its role in Myanmar politics by indulging Myanmar politics. And now, this is another example in Mandalay where you will see uh, boats like this, the Tatmadaw will, ne will, ne will never betray a national cause. What does it mean? It essentially means that we are the only institution that is holding this country together. And if you take us out of the political process, then this country may fall apart. So we, we, we have a legitimate role. We have a legitimate say in the political processes. That is how Myanmar military sees and validates its role. Having said that, uh, now how did Myanmar military move to the elections that we have seen in 2010 and, and the coming elections in 2015. Now, the the one referendum that they did in 1974, highly uh, contentious, and after that there were no elections. The only elections that were conducted were again after 1974 referendum was 1990 elections following the student uprising in 1998. 
Now, what happened with the 1990 elections was Aung San Suu Kyi had a, a landslide electoral victory. She got 59% of the vote and 80% of the seats in the legislative assembly or the legislatures, sorry, the union parliament. Now, as a consequence, uh, military did not have a game plan on how to handle uh, the post-election uh, uh, situation in 1990. So military had to come back uh, through violent means, through a coup and other uh, mechanisms. When I say military had to come back, I am not saying it as a good thing, but I am trying to tell you that how military is thinking, because they didn't have an adequate action plan on how to handle the uh, transition process. Immediately after elections, when Aung San Suu Kyi had a landslide victory, there was a lesson learned that is we need to modulate the transition process. We need to open up slowly and steadily so that we can continue to have a major say in the political process. That's how the military is thinking. I'm putting my ships in the shoes of military. I'm not validating its role, but I'm just trying to tell you how the military was thinking at that specific point of time. Uh, in 2010 elections, therefore, uh, it becomes important to have a planned, modulated opening up of political space. Now, when we think of uh, why it happened, why 2010, why not earlier, why not before, one that comes is 2007, uh, we had monks protest in large, in large numbers in different parts of Myanmar because of sudden price rise. Then you had Cyclone Nergis in 2008, uh, when almost 84,500 people died according to Red Cross, unofficially it's over a lakh people, uh, that's a huge numbers. And there are uh, reports and there are uh, 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 many uh, news items which suggest that even military rulers felt that it's not military alone cannot handle these kinds of uh, situations and you need to allow civil society. And if you see the growth of civil society in Myanmar in the recent past, it happened after Cyclone Nargis when Myanmar government started opening up and letting civil society organizations to function yeah, under certain constraints definitely, but nonetheless certain amount of opening up of political spaces taken. The other thing that we talk about when we often talk about Myanmar military rule is that we, we term it as a junta as though it is a group of collection of generals. Yes, indeed it is so, but it is being led by and when this elderly uh, dictator wanted to retire, he needed to have a, uh, a, a, a planned transition process. Uh, uh, while we call it a junta, it is definitely a single person leading the show in a substantial manner. So how do you have a planned transition when the top gun wants to retire, uh, wants to move out of the scene? So he wanted to have a phased planned transition process. Then there was also a growing perception in Myanmar that while the rest of the Southeast Asian neighbors were moving ahead, Myanmar was lagging behind economically. So how do you open up uh, uh, and how do you become like your some of your colleagues? So you need to have some, some kind of an international engagement, some, some kind of an international economic engagement, and you need to get out of the sanctions business. So you need to open up political space. That's the thinking that guided Myanmar military. And the other thing uh, that Myanmar military also quickly realized was that uh, it's, uh, while it had a very large defense force, uh, it, its modernization was lagging behind severely. So if you want to modernize military, you need to depend on, uh, you need to have diverse sources uh, uh, to access latest technologies. You can't just depend on China again. And there's this fear that you are increasingly getting, getting sucked into the Chinese orbit. So all these events coalesce together uh, into uh, facilitating 2010 elections in Myanmar. And before we talk about transitions, we need to remember that political transitions, countries don't just overnight become democracies just like that. It needs to have, uh, as Robert Putnam and others call, uh, a density of civil society associations. A lot of things need to fall into place uh, for countries to become democratic. Overnight, you cannot have democratic transitions. We have seen in our own neighborhood in Pakistan and other places where they swing between civilian government and, uh, and the military rule quite often. And one of the scholars in Delhi says Pakistan should be given a world record or Guinness Book of Records for the kind of military rule and civilian rule it has. I mean, that's the kind of swings that this region has witnessed uh, when we talk about transitions. Uh, so Myanmar, uh, 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 and there is another phase that comes in when countries start moving from military to authoritarian, from an authoritarian regime to a, a democratic regime, there is a phase called semi-democracy or a semi-authoritarian phase, as Larry Diamond and others call, uh, talk about, where the uh, there is a mix, where there is a certain an element of freedom, but there is also a certain element of constraints and authoritarianism in the political system. The Myanmar military leaders precisely picked up such kind of a political model. If you take a 2008 constitution, it does not talk about full-fledged parliamentary democracy. It talks about a disciplined, genuine multi-party democracy. The preamble uses the word, the defense services will provide national political leadership. The constitution uses the word power sharing between the elected representatives and defense forces. So what did Myanmar military was planning? Myanmar 
Myanmar military was planning not a full-fledged democracy when it was organizing 2010 elections, but it was planning a semi-democracy or a semi-authoritarian frameworks when it was organizing 2010 elections. Now, 25% of seats in legislatures uh, were given were reserved for the military. Section 436 uh, mandates that any constitutional reform uh, needs to have a uh, 75% uh, referendum. Major ministries are reserved for the military. Now, 2010 elections results were announced and uh, NLD did not contest the election. Naturally, the military supported uh, USDP, Union Solidarity Development Party, has gained control in Union legislature, winning 80% in upper house and about 70% in 80% uh, in lower house and 70% in upper house. Uh, the state legislatures, the interesting dimensions have taken place even in 2010 elections when military was controlling the process. Regional parties, Rakhine National Development Party, 151% of the seats. Uh, Chin National Party and Chin People's Party together witnessed 56% of the seats in the Chin state. Similarly, Shan, Shan National Development Party and others witnessed significant electoral victories. 2010 by-elections, Aung San Suu Kyi comes into power, uh, sorry, comes into a uh, political process. She wins only 43 out of 45 seats. All, I mean, it's a landslide by a victory in the by-elections. But nonetheless, uh, the total number of seats she controls in the legislature is minimal. So therefore, uh, her, her capacity to bring about changes is limited. They have tried to bring about many reforms, uh, uh, tried to push through the reforms along with 88 generation of students. They have collected 5 million signatures, but very little progress was seen on two critical fronts. What is that? One, Section 109, which ensures that 25% of seats in national legislatures and other legislatures are reserved for the military. And the other is Article 59F pertaining to foreign citizenship. A quick point here that people often think that this article is specifically targeted at Aung San Suu Kyi. I don't think so. This article was there in all constitutions of Myanmar starting from independence. In 1948 constitution it was called Article 49. Uh, it was there. Uh, so Myanmar had a history of anxieties, as I pointed out, which resulted in such articles coming into place into the constitution. And a recent attempt at amending the constitution was made. but reducing the possibilities of amending from 75 to 70 percent, even this did not succeed. Uh, military, therefore, in the last four years, in the modulated opening up of space, has retained uh, its uh, strength in the legislature, its presence in the legislature. In coming to the religion, Myanmar of Tatmadaw had a complex relationship with uh, the Buddhist Sangha or the clergy. One, uh, 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 while it is UNU recognized Buddhism as a state religion, Niven sort of had a lukewarm attitude and sought to control the Sangha through various committees and administrative processes. But 1998 and 1990, when the Buddhist clergy fully supported democracy movement, the, there, was a, uh, there was a change in the processes and Tatmadaw started reward, rewarding monks who started cooperating with it. But nonetheless, there are limitations to such an approach because when overall society is experiencing deprivation, if you are re rewarding few monks, the other monks will also be disappointed. So you had an saffron uprising when prices were uh, uh, increased on fuel, prices were increased in 2007. Now, this has related, uh, relation to the sectarian violence that is happening in Rakhine state. Uh, what has happened in Rakhine state? You had Rohingya violence happening in Rakhine state. I will not go into the dynamics of Rohingya violence, but I would like to point out that if the elections coming closer, the, 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 the rhetoric on uh, Rakhine violence will increase substantially. Uh, Myanmar government clearly says that there is no ethnic group called Rohingyas in its midst and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, treats them as illegal immigrants. Now, what has this sectarian violence done? It has placed Aung San Suu Kyi in a tight spot. Uh, if she speaks for Rohingyas, she will lose her voting base in Buddhist uh, groups. If she doesn't speak, she will lose her uh, 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 base in the international community. And uh, there is an anti-Chinese feeling have also been clouded by these uh, uh, sectarian violence. Now, in this context, which way will Sangha lean? The Buddhist Sangha will lean. It is true, Buddhist Sangha is not a homogeneous entity. There are many monasteries and others, many groups, but nonetheless, we need to figure that out. The, one of the last important issues is ethnic conflict. As Ambassador pointed out today morning, there has been an attempt to ensure national ceasefires uh, in different parts of, uh, involving about 15 uh, armed ethnic groups the final accord seems to be el elusive. What is the game plan? Are ethnic armed groups trying to uh, uh, have a dialogue after the elections once they have significant presence in the national legislature? That seems to be the uh, uh, situation at the moment. Now, uh, 
in terms of economy uh, the last thing uh, is that Myanmar uh, opening up has not undermined the military's economic interest, rather it has facilitated the economic interest because Myanmar military families have benefited uh, from uh, this opening up of the political process. Second, various armed groups, leaders who are associated with Myanmar military have also started benefiting from uh, the opening up of the political process. So the new economy and the, new uh, and the relationship it has with military has resulted in consolidation of uh, economic interests of the military and rewarded political actors who are willing to work with uh, Myanmar military. Now, to summarize, uh, finally, uh, what is it that Myanmar Tatmadaw, uh, the Tatmadaw military has done? One, it has ensured that the constitutional frameworks through which it seeks to operate, uh, uh, it has still, military is still in control and still in place. Uh, in sectarian issues, uh, the growth of sectarian violence, uh, will it result in uh, the denting of uh, popularity of National League for De Democracy? Will it result in uh, uh, other political groups gaining uh, electoral advantage because of sectarian politics that needs to be seen? On ethnic issues, how do you make them uh, on ethnic, various ethnic armed groups, how do you integrate them into the Myanmar Defense Forces and make them one cohesive unit? That's a challenge that Myanmar uh, Tatmadaw is trying to do. But Myanmar Tatmadaw has increased its strength substantially. Uh, why? Because of opening up of the economy has given it revenues and it is acquiring newer and newer weapons. The balance between armed ethnic groups and Tatmadaw has shifted substantially in favor of Myanmar military. Uh, in terms of economy, the new economic forces did not unleash new bourgeois or the new capitalist class or, the, or it has not increased the density of the business personnel in Myanmar. So the uh, Tatmadaw's economic control has not been undermined. In terms of personality with Aung San Suu Kyi out of the equation uh, for presidential post, Shwe Man is in contention or uh, who will else come into play that needs to be seen. Uh, finally, uh, elections happening in 2015, November 8. Uh, what would be the scenarios? NLD coming to power, landslide electoral victory, possibility. NLD and USDP with Shweman coming together, uh, tying up uh, post-poll elections, it will result in consolidation of Burmese ethnic groups. Uh, if NLD ties up with ethnic groups into the elections or post-poll elections, then it throws up new challenges. Uh, the Myanmar military will be slightly uncomfortable with an alliance between uh, NLD and ethnic groups because it generates anxiety about what kind of federal structure or decentralization that come into place. If it is a hung parliament, not possible at the moment, but a week is a long time in politics, as they say, uh, then Myanmar military with 25% of presence in the legislatures uh, comes into a, a decisive play. Uh, this is how Myanmar military is uh, planning the transition process where it can retain significant control through constitutional means, through political processes and sectarian issues, through economy and through uh, uh, controlling the possibilities of what kind of personalities will come onto the political scene after the elections. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay, because in a very uh, brief period you have given uh, an overview of how the Tamarov is engaging in the ongoing process, the political process in the country, and its hopes, and its visions, and its desires. Uh, and you have also touched on in, uh, issue, uh, uh, important issues like the role of the monks, and also the role of the political uh, parties as well. And I thank you for your presentation. And the next person that uh, I would like to invite is Dr. Yula Ferbrucken. Well, Dr. Uh, Yula, if you, you don't mind if I call you Dr. Yula, uh, has been a journalist in Myanmar since 2012. So I think she is, in a way, very familiar with our country. And I, she has been writing articles about the impact and scope of the reforms that has been going on in the country. And, uh, I, and at the same time, uh, she has traveled extensively in our nations, including the, the Rakhine State, where all the, you know, the 
issues are taking place. And uh, he has covered uh, both the, the problem of the insurgencies that our nation uh, is facing, has faced since 1948, to, to tell you frankly. And I'm sure that uh, we'll greatly benefit uh, from our presentation. You have the floor. Yes, I'll time it. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. We can leave out the doctor, which I'm not, so just Yola will do. Um, I've been asked to um, talk about the uh, interaction between the center and the periphery in Myanmar. And I think the, um, the best way to start um, telling you about that is uh, with uh, something I encountered when I was uh, working. Um, it was related to the Kokang conflict in Northern Shan State. Um, of course, um, all journalists really wanted to go there, but access was too dangerous. We couldn't actually get into the area. So what most people decided to do is speak to the people who were displaced by the violence to get an, an idea of what was going on. So did I. I went to Lasho, where lots of the migrant workers, um, they are Burmese, but they are from uh, lower areas in Burma. They worked um, in Laukhai, in the Kokang area. Um, they had fled from the violence. They were uh, being transported um, to Lasho, to a monastery um, where they were taken care of. Um, so I went there to talk to them. And at the time when I was there, the uh, vice president um, uh, was there. And he was talking to the migrants. Um, he was um, obviously there to show his um, support for uh, the military, the, the Tatmadaw, as well as for the migrant workers. Um, he was handing out money. Um, I think every household got 5,000 chats, which is about uh, $5. Um, I have spoken to many IDPs um, displaced by other conflicts in the country, and I'd never seen anything like this. The vice president coming to visit, handing out money, waving off uh, migrant workers as they were transported back uh, to their uh, native towns elsewhere in, in Burma. Um, so it was very interesting um, to see also the, the way that the migrant workers, um, who were um, uh, predominantly uh, Burma, um, were interaction, uh, interacting with the vice president. Um, and then an, about an hour after the vice president had left, there arrived a big truck um, with migrant workers, again from Laokai, who had um, been um, taken out of the area. But as they were uh, driving away from Laokai, their convoy had been shot at um, by whom they didn't know. I think that was very unclear. It's a very chaotic situation. Um, but the driver had tried to um, speed away. Uh, the car had overturned. Everybody coming out of the car could barely walk. Um, uh, they were, had blooded faces. Their eyes were black. Um, they had obviously been in a very bad car accident. Seven of them had died along the way. It, it was a horrible scene. They were taken into the monastery, uh, taken care of by, um, uh, by the doctors. There were army doctors. Um, there to take care of the migrant, the injured migrant workers. And as they were there, a lot of um, uh, people from uh, the other migrant workers who were standing around looking at what was going on um, were t uh, talking about how much they supported the military and how they should defeat these rebels who were um, shooting at civilians. And it was something I had never heard before, even though there's a lot of talk by the Tabmadaw saying we are the ones keeping unity in our country. I had never actually spoken to many civilians um, who would s s uh, uh, voice their support for the army. So it was very interesting to see that. But then I was with a translator who was Kachin from the ethnic minorities. And he was very angry because he said, I have never seen anything like this. There is a conflict in Kachin state, in Shan state. Where is the government there? They're not handing out money there. They're not transporting us to safety. Um, why, why this difference? Why are we still being discriminated against? And I think this is where I would like to start my, um, uh, my discussion of, of what is going on in these um, um, ethnic minority areas, because the, 
obviously there has for a long time been this idea that the, the Bama um, are privileged, um, the, the ethnic minorities are discriminated against, um, but as the 2008 constitution was implemented, the states, the seven states, which uh, have um, uh, predominantly uh, ethnic minority populations, were given their own governments. So you would say that um, they feel less discriminated against, they have more of a, um, a possibility to have a say in what's happening in, the, in their country. Um, but there is still a lot of structural um, obstructions that actually prevents them from having that influence that they think they should have in the areas where they live. Um, so I will um, uh, tell you a little bit about the structure of, the, of these um, states and also there are seven states, seven regions. The regions are predominantly Burman and the states predominantly um, uh, ethnic minorities. Um, so um, the governance of these states is now in, in the hands of the state luto or the, the state parliament. Um, these representatives are elected from all the townships in these states. Uh, two uh, representatives are elected per township. Um, on top of that, each um, national race, which is the recognized uh, ethnic minorities um, uh, in the country, if they have a population of at least 0.1% in the country, they get an extra ethnic representative. Um, and on top of that, there is, as in the union uh, parliament, 25% uh, of the seats is reserved for the army. Um, at the moment, in total, and this is the regions and states combined, there is about 19% of all seats in all these region and state parliaments that are not occupied by the military or um, the USDP, the, the ruling party. But as uh, Dr. Sanjay just correctly said, there is also some states in which the ethnic parties have actually um, been able to get a lot of seats. For example, in Rakhine, Shin and, and Shan state, as he, as he pointed out. Um, but um, the influence of these uh, lutos, of these parliaments, is diminished by the fact that the chief minister of all these states is directly appointed by the president. Um, uh, at the moment, um, basically all the state um, uh, chief ministers are from the USDP, from the ruling party, apart from in Karen state, where it's an ex uh, active military officer. So none are from uh, the ethnic minority parties. Um, the parliament does have to approve this chief minister, but they can only disapprove if they can clearly prove that the person does not have the necessary qualifications, which is a very difficult process, so it basically means they have very little to say about it. Um, this chief minister who was appointed by the, um, uh, by the uh, president selects then the ministers for his cabinet. Um, and the president then decides on the portfolio these ministers will have. And as at, also at the union level, there is the um, uh, minister for security and border affairs, who is appointed by the commander in chief of the military. Um, so the ethnic minority representatives in the Luto have asked why can't, uh, can't we choose our own um, chief minister that would make things a lot fairer, that would make us feel more represented, uh, but the military has made clear that they wouldn't support this and obviously this would require a constitutional amendment without military support that is never going to happen um, because they have an effective veto in the parliament. Um, also the um, uh, the legislative power of the um, st state parliaments is limited to certain um, areas. Uh, for example, finance planning, economics, um, agriculture, um, energy, electricity, uh, industry. There is a lot of sectors included, but for all these sectors, their powers are quite limited. The, their responsibilities are still quite narrow. And also important sectors like health um, and education, um, a lot of the mining projects that still is uh, is in uh, the um, the central government is in charge of that. So the um, ethnic minorities still have little to say about that. Um, this is also obviously for the non-state armed groups in the peace process. Now they have um, time and again voiced that this is a, a big obstruction in the process. They don't. They still don't feel like they actually. Uh, have a say in what's happening in their state. For example, um, the union has the right to manage all the large-scale uh, electric power production and distribution, 
and only for the medium and small um, electricity projects, the state Luto, uh, Luto has um, uh, legislative power. Um, yes, the, um, for the uh, judiciary, the president also appoints the chief justice of the high court. He does get help f uh, from the chief minister and the chief justice of the union, but also these have been appointed by him. Um, this creates a, a, a murky overlap between the executive and the um, uh, judiciary, um, which is obvious, uh, often a claim made by the opposition. We don't have an independent judiciary. And with things like this laid down in the constitution, it, it is very difficult to deny that. Um, the township and district courts um, and the self-administered zones um, have some own jurisdiction on some cases like criminal cases or civil cases. Um, but larger discussions, obviously things to do with the constitution, um, are still decided on uh, by the uh, union level constitutional uh, tribunal. Um, all in all, this system um, is still far from uh, the federal state uh, that the ethnic armed groups would have in mind. Um, and uh, to complicate things further, in Shan State, there is a lot of self-administered areas. Um, some of the uh, ethnic groups have been uh, given their own, uh, re their own area. And there is five in Shan State, which Shan State is one of the biggest states of the country. It comprises if I'm correct, about 25% of the country. Um, there's one um, other self-administrative zone in Sagain region, and those are the only states that have any. Um, these uh, self-administrative areas are um, uh, governed by um, a, a leading body. And there is no set amount of members for this body. Um, it is. It has to be at least 10, but there is. that is the only uh, regulation there seems to be. Um, it consists of um, uh, region or state Luto representatives elected from the townships in this particular area um, and other representatives that are selected by them. Um, the military then sees what is the eventual number of um, uh, civilian representatives and matches one third um, of these representatives. So also in the self-administered areas, 25% of the uh, members of the uh, legit, um, of the leading body is um, the uh, military personnel. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, they have a, a lot less to say though than the region parliament. Um, they have more to say on urban and rural projects, construction uh, and maintenance of roads, public health, uh, development affairs, um, water in and electricity in towns and villages, it's a lot less. The only problem is um, the overlap between the state or region parliament and these self-administered zones is that their responsibilities don't seem necessarily very clear. So it's not always clear who can make a decision about what. And sometimes the leading bodies report directly to NAPIDO rather than to the region or state governments, uh, which bypasses them, which obviously frustrates these elected representatives that they are, that they are powerless to implement what they want in these, in these other areas. It's, um, it's still very murky. It's not very clear who has something to say and what. Then there's the um, uh, this, the union level uh, parliament that also has something to say over the regions and um, the budgets are still centrally controlled um, so it's uh, difficult to actually have a cl clear overview of what these ethnic representatives in the parliament uh, have to say about what is happening um, and then there are of course the non-state armed groups um, they have areas under their control. They have set up own administrations there. They often have developed structures for health, uh, for education, infrastructure. These also operate separately from the government structures. Um, obviously, the government doesn't necessarily recognize these structures that have been set up. So there, there is another um, level of complexity um, in, the, in the governing of these states. And now that most of these groups have signed ceasefires with the, the government, even though there is still um, clashes occurring, um, connecting the state and non-state service regime would build trust and relieve the communities actually living in these areas. 
but because they are still deemed illegal organizations, this cooperation is very difficult. Um, also, Myanmar's peace process is not yet entered in a post-conflict phase, and so only limited cooperation is discussed um, in individual ceasefires. For example, the National Democratic Alliance Army in Eastern Shan State has agreed in its, its ceasefire agreement with the government that INGOs can come into their area and they will cooperate for development, health and education, transportation, mining and electricity. So there is some cooperation um, uh, happening. And also in um, Shan State, uh, with the PAO National uh, Liberation Organization, the political wing of the um, uh, PAO uh, army, um, has agreed that they will coordinate with the government on agricultural projects. This to, so to, uh, to some extent, the government has obviously recognized the need to develop these areas. A lot of the frustration from the, the ethnic groups comes from the fact that they are so underdeveloped, even in relation to the underdeveloped rest of the country. Um, and the Chin National Front, one of the um, poorest states in the country, um, um, they have agreed to set up a special economic zone, um, allow tourists to travel freely and build a highway and an airport. These are things they could never do without cooperation with the government and the government couldn't do without being sure they would have the cooperation of this armed group, otherwise it could lead to conflict. Um, that's, having said that, uh, most of the projects in these ethnic states do still happen without the cooperation of the ethnic armed groups. Um, there is many development projects that have been brought to these rural areas of Myanmar and it could have um, a positive influence on the areas, like the Wei, the Lawa, Chao Piu, uh, special economic zones, but they are fear to burden the population rather than benefit them because there is no agreement yet on revenue sharing and um, there is no clear view of it that will generate jobs. Instead, all that people have seen now is that their land has been taken away from them and um, there's negative social environmental consequences. Um, and then the constitution determines as well that the government remains the ultimate owner of all lands in the country. So it is the ethnic armed groups are not confident that they will anyhow benefit from these from these projects. Um, and for the uh, trust building also with the communities, the communities have obviously been suffered, uh, have suffered most from the, the conflict between the non-state armed groups and the government. Um, to build that trust, they want to see their areas develop, they want to see that these two um, sides can cooperate for the benefit of the people. But there is um, Section 17.1 of the Unlawful Association Act that actually prohibits civilians from working together with these um, armed groups because they are still deemed illegal organizations. Um, associating with them will land you in prison for two to three years. Um, so it, this is an extra obstruction in, in trying to combine the government and, and, um, and, the, and, services, and the services from the non-state armed groups. Um, there is a provision included though in the national ceasefire, uh, nationwide ceasefire draft, uh, which obviously has not been signed yet, um, that would take all signatories of the agreement of the unlawful association list and while government side negotiations have said this is a big step forward, this has never happened, we've never actually acknowledged them, um, the ethnic groups say, well, maybe why don't we just appeal, um, uh, repeal this law altogether? Um, I think for um, most of the uh, non-state armed groups and also no lots of the um, ethnic minority civilians, they are afraid that with all these um, um, clauses included in the constitution that it's not um, a way for more influence for them but that this is as far as it gets like all these obstructions are in the constitution the military doesn't want to change the constitution so they are afraid that it is this is what they're getting and 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 that's the end of it so we'll have to show over the next few years whether the the military will be willing to um, change the constitution and that way improve Burma ethnic relations in the country. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, in a very uh, short time, you have been able to cover Ms. Yola, 
I am sorry that I uh, made the wrong designation, Ms. Yola, that in a very uh, brief overview, you have been able to touch on one of the most important and at the same time intricate and difficult issue of the relations between the center and the periphery. Because this is going to be one of the main issues that is going to dominate the Myanmar politics, in the, especially in this period of transition. Because, as you, uh, all of you know, and as was also mentioned this, in those, this morning, there is also talk about, already about setting up a federal system in the country. But how to, to agree to set up a federal system is one thing. But how to do that, and in what way are we going to achieve that? Well, that's another matter. But I'm uh, very happy to learn from you how the relationship between the center and the periphery, which is going to be one of our main occupations in the immediate future. Thank you. He is also the coordinator uh, of the core group on Myanmar. So uh, he is very well versed on Myanmar affairs. And uh, I look forward very much to listening to his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, sir, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Dr. Mile and his team for putting up uh, such a great show, and I'm honored to be uh, at NIAS and part of this uh, lovely conference. Uh, now, as you know, much ground has already been covered by Ambassador Sheshadri and my good friend Sanjay, who's also my co-panelist. Uh, as to who the major stakeholders in the transition to democracy are, what are their expectations, and what are their roles in the next five to six months from now. So uh, let me try and add to what has already been said. And what, I, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, divide my presentation into three parts. First, I will, I will very briefly speak to you about uh, the recent developments on democratic front that have taken place, uh, followed by a kind of bro a brief overview on the expectations and roles of the major stakeholders in the democratic transition, and finally, my observations on the future of democracy in Myanmar. Uh, now, so far as the current developments are concerned, uh, these are, all of us know, led by President Thien Sen. Uh, when in 2010, uh, the USDP, the Union Solidarity and uh, Democratic Party, uh, won the elections, nobody had expected that this kind of transition will take place. Uh, from March 2011, even in March 2011, when uh, 31st March, when he took over, uh, people thought that it would be a, a more of a sham uh, in the name of democracy. But the reform measures that, the, that President Thien Sen has taken over these uh, close to three years have been remarkable. And this is remarkable, I would say exceptional in South Asia, for the sim single reason that these changes are not propelled from below. So there, there is clearly a, a top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach. We don't see a, a, a Tahrir Square burning here. We, what we have seen is uh, a leader who's all of a sudden, God knows what transpired and how he got motivated in doing this, but here was a leader who uh, on his own started this transition, and he was uh, very ably backed by his cabinet. Uh, in, a, in a very positive surprise, the Tatmada was also more or less agreeing to the transition. So it, it's, a, it's a unique situation in Myanmar at this moment. And I believe uh, when the history of Myanmar, as it has already been written, uh, 10, 20 years down the line, Myanmar would be remembered as, as an exceptional case of democratic transition. How far successful the, this transition is, we are yet to determine. But having said that, I would add that uh, even cases like Indonesia or Thailand, uh, South Korea, to some, uh, some extent, have seen this kind of slow and gradual transition which took place over, over a period of two and a half decades. Now, coming to the specifics, uh, right after he assumed office, he uh, convened new legislatures, uh, granted amnesty to thousands of prisoners, improved human rights conditions, though one wouldn't say that 
uh, that the human rights situation in the country is at its best now. But improvement certainly has happened, and we must uh, acknowledge that. Uh, citizens have now got the rights to, uh, to form unions, to conduct peaceful protests, uh, things which they had not imagined uh, in the past half century. Uh, the government has also, and this was not a, a, not a self-obsessed leader. I mean, Tiansen is not a self-obsessed leader without uh, getting into uh, uh, his praise. I would say that he is the one who initiated this mechanism, uh, an institutional mechanism to engage Aung San Suu Kyi in a dialogue which uh, was a success. And that's how in the uh, in, in 2000 elections, when LD boycotted the elections, the party got deregistered. But uh, in the April 2012 uh, by-elections, uh, NLD was re-registered, Aung San Suu Kyi for the elections, they got the seats, and uh, we know everything about it. So it was Thien Sen who involved Aung San Suu Kyi in this democratic process, in this institutional engagement with the opposition, which is remarkable for, uh, for a former military general coming to democracy and, and facing criticism and uh, uh, stones from the international community and the neighborhood, including India. Uh, Thien Sen has also attempted to, uh, to end the ongoing ethnic strife. We know that most of it is a kind of failure now, but he had initiated talks with a ceasefire dialogue with Kachins and the Karens and Mons, to a certain extent Mons is a success. Uh, but as I said, uh, Kachins and Kokangs, uh, it is more or less a failure now. Uh, but we can't blame uh, one of the parties for two. Uh, it's, it takes two to tango. So, so in terms of ethnic reconciliation, a lot of homework is still uh, needed in Myanmar. In terms of economic reforms, uh, like any country which opens up to, to the forces of globalization and to the forces of open economy, there were fears at the beginning. We have seen this in case of India uh, uh, in the 1990s, and there were a lot of protests domestically against economic reforms. But we didn't see that kind of protest against ec uh, opening up of the economy. What we've seen rather is that, uh, that Myanmar has become Asia's number one tourist destination within the past two and a half years, three years. The country has opened up to the IT, energy, and infrastructure sector. Uh, and also, uh, India, by the way, has got stakes in the, uh, uh, in the energy sector. And these investments are not just confined to China. So it's not just that, that financial backing is coming from, your, uh, from a country's best friend, and that's how things are uh, moving around. Uh, the investments are coming from uh, from unexpected partners, from Japan, from South Korea. Most of the investment actually is coming from Asia, not from, uh, uh, from the Western world. Uh, something which uh, nobody had expected. We thought that the Americans and the Europeans would uh, invest a lot in, in Myanmar. But Singapore, Japan, and South Korea are taking the lead, which is a good news for us. Uh, educational reforms have also uh, come in, and more freedom has been given to the media, which, and that's the reason why We've got access to what is happening, the, the information related to Myanmar and as to what is happening in the country. So to my mind, the situation is more or less in control, considering the short span of time between what Myanmar was in 2010, 2009, and what it is today. Uh, but still, uh, my co-panelists, and I'm sure uh, in the course of the next two and a half days, uh, there will be a lot of questions, a lot of uh, doubts uh, cast on the democratic transition in the country. Uh, we can come to that later, perhaps. Uh, now, the second uh, part of my presentation is the major stakeholders uh, and Myanmar's aspirations in, in terms of becoming a democracy, uh, democracy and, and becoming a fully functional democratic country with, uh, with, uh, with functioning democratic institution, the components of a democracy. Uh, to my mind, this, uh, the Myanmar's inspirations, uh, aspirations are a sum of aspirations of all its stakeholders, big and small. And each stakeholder in Myanmar today has got a role to play. They can act as a contributor to the democratic transition. But if they are not willing to, to go ahead with the, with the flow, go with the flow, they can act as spoilers. And I'll tell you how. Uh, to my mind, there are eight major stakeholders. First and foremost, uh, the Tatpada or the Armed Forces of Myanmar. Uh, Sanjay has already talked much about that. The second is USDP, the Union, Union Solidarity and Development Party, and the President Thien Sen. I've clubbed them together because 
Tatna Dao now is different from what uh, their ideas are different, what, how it thinks about transition is different from uh, Tiansen, and he is the president anyways. Uh, third is the National League of Democracy, uh, National League for Democracy, NLD, and Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, fourth, you have the ethnic minorities, including the, the Kachins, Karens, Rohingyas, or the Bengalis, as our uh, Myanmar people call them. The business groups, both domestic and foreign, the big and the small, and the foreign investors, both Asians and the Westerners. I'm, I'm putting uh, Asians as different from Westerners because Asians have got different ideas on democracy. I mean, I'm not talking about India, I'm talking about the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, then the international community, uh, particularly uh, the US and the European Union. Uh, seventh are the religious groups, uh, particularly the monks, the nationalist uh, monks, Buddhist monks who have come to the uh, f forefront now in terms of determining as to how the social fabric of the country should be. How should the the country make transition in terms of social representation. And finally, uh, last but not the least, the common people of Myanmar. We'll go to each of them and see how democratic, what democratic transition means for them and how uh, they, are, they are deciding a role for themselves, what the role they are going to play in coming months. The Tatmadaw, as Sanjay has rightly pointed out, is one of the most important factors. I'm calling them the most important actor in the Myanmar politics at this uh, hour. Uh, because it has a tight control over SDP, uh, USDP. Most of the cadre actually comes from the Myanmar army, the Tatna Dao. For years, Tatna Dao has occupied the center stage in Myanmar politics. And they're still finding it difficult to leave that position. And that's why we have this difference between Tatna Dao's approach and USDP's approach now. Uh, and I believe in all likelihood they will find it very difficult to leave that center stage. And that's why, and I'll come to the details later, that's why they vetoed this idea of 25% was a 75%, 70-30 uh, idea. Uh, coming to the role of, uh, uh, the analysis of the Tatmadaw's role in Myanmar politics, I would like to quote what uh, David Steinberg had said about the control by Tatmadaw or, or and, and he says that Tatmadaw has control over all avenues of social mobility, which is a unique feature, at least in Asia, if not the rest of the world. He means Latin American countries. And that is something which makes Myanmar different from the rest of Asia, and uh, including Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and South Korea, all of which have dominated the, uh, for various periods uh, by their local militaries." Unquote. What it essentially means to say is that Tatmadaw doesn't have control over just the government apparatus. They have control over the social, the administrative, and even the local administration of the country. And that's the reason why we see that they have an overarching control, or let's say influence, over uh, the country's apparatus. Uh, however, it is clear that Tatmadaw, Tatmadaw's return to uh, Myanmar politics or military rule in Myanmar is highly unlikely. Uh, but it is not impossible. I mean, we don't know for sure what, hap what will happen in November and how international actors will play a role. It also depends on how much of investment countries have done because for them, stability is more important. I'll come to that later. Uh, the second USDP, like I mentioned before, uh, their role after the elections, I think, is uh, likely to shrink. And USD USDP knows it. And that's why... Uh, what they are doing is they're just going with the flow. I mean, USDP at this moment doesn't have a strategy of its own. What they're doing is uh, is following what Tian Sen has, has decided for them, what Tatmadaw has decided for them. So as a political party, USDP knows its future. And their role, their, they know that their role is going to shrink after November 8th elections. Uh, but we don't know for sure because there is this dark horse, uh, Thura Shweman who is the Speaker of the Low House, uh, their poli their, the party and his uh, approach towards the elections, towards the NLD, might see a shift in, in coming months uh, because it is an exi existential threat for them. Tatmadaw will remain there, but what will happen to USDP is the question that Thura Shaiman should be asking himself. Now coming to NLD, 
the good news for everybody is that NLD has decided to participate in the elections, and that gives the fundamental uh, that uh, the sanctity to the elections. So one point is very clear that uh, international community and the people of Myanmar are going to accept this election as a fair process. Whether the counting and the, uh, the, the electoral rules are fair or not, that is up to the procedural part of it. But, but if you look at it in terms of idea, in terms of this uh, uh, major event of the country, that has been given sanctity, and NLD cannot back out from that. They also had, Aung San Suu Kyi had perhaps the, uh, the feeling that once she approves of the elections, perhaps she'll get a chance to, to fight for the presidential, she'll get that leeway, uh, but that has unfortunately not happened. Uh, but if, if April 2012 elections are any indications, we know that NLD is going to have a big block, big share in the, in the seats, and that is going to determine their future also. Uh, in her 11th July statement, Aung San Suu Kyi had said that when they come to power and they have the sweeping majority, they might perhaps uh, ask for change in the constitution. I don't see that happening because, uh, because you have got uh, other parties also, the Shans and Mons and Chins, uh, they have their own share. And these are the groups which are not in tandem with NLD's ideas. Uh, uh, the, ethnic on, uh, the ethnic conflict that is happening uh, in the Kachin and the uh, and, and these areas, uh, Rakhine, for example, Aung San Suu Kyi has no views. So therefore, I don't think she's going, and by the way, she's not going to even campaign for elections in the Rakhine state. So you know how uh, clear she is on these ideas, on these issues. The ethnic minorities I've already covered. I'm running short of time, so I'll just uh, run through quickly. The business groups, I think for them, uh, more than democracy, it's a stability which matters. And there, I think uh, Tianjin and, and USDP has a chance in the sense that uh, even if it is not a fair play uh, and an LD wins some seats, a couple of hundred of seats, uh, international community would be okay with that. US will, of course, raise some questions and there, and European Union would also say, say uh, stuff. But I think the Asian countries would more or less leave Myanmar to what, what uh, I mean, as to what it decides for itself. So, uh, an international monitoring, international observations, though they are in place, they are in place. I, I have not seen uh, the American statements on the procedure as such. They, they are only talking of the substantial aspect of it. So, as long as the Americans are not involved in the procedural aspect of electoral process, uh, I think uh, uh, the government, TNCN, both have still a, a, a way out. Uh, that covers the international community's role also, uh, the US. Uh, they've already made their choices more or less clear. In coming months, I think by September, October, we'll get to know as to what the, the, what the uh, Western world feels about it, uh, also in terms of human rights and all. Uh, the monks are another uh, very important role player in, in uh, stakeholder in the Myanmar politics now because of their sharpness, listic ideas. They are, it's not that they are following USDP or NLD. Uh, the situation is changed from 2006, 7, 8 to 2014, 13, 14, 15. In, in the sense that now Buddhist monks are uh, sharply nationalistic and they also have their own agenda. So they are going to vote for a party, I believe, which supports their ideas, which supports their agenda and manifesto. And there you have a role of the smaller parties which, ha uh, which are coming to the front. So that is going to, to kill uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's votes, uh, NLD's vote, and also USDP because they, uh, though both of these parties have remained silent, uh, they have not actively supported uh, the monk groups. Uh, finally, the people of Myanmar. I wouldn't say that people have not benefited. They have, of course, uh, got better off uh, with this reform process. Uh, but they must have expected a lot more than what they've got. Uh, widespread peace, nationwide peace, poverty elevation, and uh, certainly a better life is something they, uh, they would have uh, expected, and they are still expecting out of the 2015 election. But the point here is that the voters or the people of Myanmar are not just based in Yangon or Mandalay or Napidaw. The people of Myanmar are also based in uh, the Shan province in the, in the Kachin 
uh, area in the Rakhine areas or even the Chin uh, Mon areas. Uh, the Nagas also, for example. And these are the people put together are going to determine the future of Myanmar. So we have to keep that also in mind. And there you have this possibility of the people of Myanmar playing a, a completely different role from what they they've been playing over the over the past several uh, decades. So uh, what happens? Two minutes. Okay. Now I think the future of democratic transition in Myanmar, therefore, is limited by at least five factors, if not more. One is that there is no change in constitution. So Aung San Suu Kyi is out, and all that euphoria is not going to last more than two, three months. At max, she is going to be, let's say, a speaker of the lower house, or uh, takes up a role which uh, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore had taken at the fag end of his, uh, his career and his life, that is to become the mentor of, uh, uh, of the NLD and the government, perhaps. Uh, a similar example would be Sonia Gandhi if, of the UPA-led government. Uh, but, but I think that's, that's too weak a role. I mean, that's too small a responsibility that Aung San Suu Kyi, a person of her stature, would take up. But that's one of the possibilities. Uh, both Thien Sen and Aung San Suu Kyi are not going to fight elections. So you don't have big names. And when the big names are out, I don't think much of international attention is going to be there. I mean, except the, uh, the negativities and the criticism of the government. Uh, if Aung San Suu Kyi is not fighting the election, who are the people who are going to, to, uh, to run for it? I mean, Thura Suleiman is there, but NLD has not appointed a, a, an alternate. So that is going to make the elections a little less uh, hyped, I would say. No ceasefire, so possibility of uh, insurgent groups uh, playing their role, uh, certainly negative, maybe militarily uh, violent also. Uh, during the election or before that, so, so that is something that India has to watch out. Uh, no participation of Rohingyas, so we know thousands of people are not going to get involved in the election. So anytime anybody can come, stand up and say that, look, your elections are not fair, they're neither free nor fair, because you, you, right from the beginning you didn't involve these set of people. Uh, definitionally, I mean, that's one question one may always pose uh, to the democratic process in Myanmar. Uh, no control of the government over disturbed areas. So that's again, I mean, how much of polling happens and how the processes are uh, done there uh, is one big challenge. Now finally, what happens in November then if these are the constraints and these are the role players? Uh, well, I think for an optimist, uh, the best scenario is that NLD sweeps the elections. Uh, the new leader comes up, Aung San Suu Kyi, I don't think is gonna come up. She's too optimistic about it. A uh, new uh, leader, Aung San Suu Kyi as a mentor or something. Uh, I've already given examples. Uh, or maybe the Speaker of the Low House. Uh, but then Tatmadaw will always, always be in control. They'll have numbers with them. And they are the key to parliamentary legislation. So uh, a parliamentary deadlock is possible. Post-elections, uh, we're going to see what what in Delhi we see uh, between Kejriwal and uh, the central government. That you have the new innovative laws and ideas, innovative ideas in place, uh, the motions in place, but not converted into reality because the military is not, Tatmadaw is not supporting you. Uh, having said that, I would add, finally, that democratic transition, the way it has uh, progressed has been remarkable. Uh, and not only remarkable, it, is, it has been so quick and so, uh, I mean, without any, uh, without much of people, people's participation. I mean, it has not involved grassroots participation in bringing about this transition. So since it has been a top-down approach, we cannot say for sure as to what the policy makers or the role players, the bigwigs of Myanmar are thinking. Uh, I mean, November could be a very surprising moment for the rest of the world in terms of uh, the major role players coming to, uh, you know, sitting across the table and finding a solution to this problem and, and Aung San Suu Kyi also uh, finding her way out. So in conclusion, I would say that Myanmar still and maybe post November elections would be a halfway house between democracy and authoritarian rule. And in all probability, it's going to be a kind of limited democracy. Uh, the future of which depends on these eight 
maybe more uh, if you would like to add. These eight push and pull factors, uh, which and, and their interplay in, in the times to come. I'll stop there. If there are any questions, I'll welcome that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rahu, I think you have given us many points to think about, and I especially like your concluding statement about the role of the eight major stakeholders and how they are going to play out, and that your observation that, of course, there, there may be some agree, uh, agreement as well as disagreement, uh, whether Myanmar will be the halfway house between democracy and dictatorship. And of course, while well, Myanmar was, first, was the first to admit that transition is not easy, and the transitional phase, I, I believe that no one, no, uh, the pre starting from the president has claimed that the transition phase is finished and Myanmar is a fully democratic country. But, uh, but having said that, I think we are running late in uh, time, and with the indulgence of the organizers, because we, uh, actually the session started about 15 to 20 minutes late. So with the indulgence of the organizers, I would like, uh, we are supposed to fin finish the session by this time, but I would like to have some time for questions, and maybe about, we can have about 15, 10 or 15 minutes of questions, and if you don't mind, a, a little bit late lunch. So I now open the floor for questions. Like? Thank you, sir. This is on Suman. I'm uh, part of NIAS. Uh, my question is to Rahul. No, it, it is to the, the whole panel. Uh, the thing is, uh, Rahul, well, very good presentation. And I, at the end, you said that so quickly things have, uh, you know, a lot of positive uh, atmosphere has been created. Don't you think that Myanmar has paid a lot of price to come to this thing? And whatever the positivity you are seeing, whatever the kind of, you know, b b opportunities you are seeing is too little to Kind of sort of, you know, but to offer to the Myanmar kind of thing. And you rightly said that uh, now that a lot of these ethnic groups are not part of the reconciliation process, how would you say that there is some sort of positivism is there in the air? Thank you. I have a question to Dr. Sanjay. Um, yeah, I'm here. I think it may look a bit naive, but given my limited knowledge and political science, but nevertheless, I thought I should ask you this question. You have said repeatedly that the military has always been there to control insurgency. But I was wondering why did not it support a popular government in 1990 and facilitate that government to control the insurgency? Was it just control insurgency or the hunger for power? And it wanted to have always been power. So that was the reason it continued to remain in power and did not want the popular government to be in place. Uh, thank you to all the presenters. I think uh, this was a most interesting session uh, with uh, very interesting uh, ideas being thrown up. And I think one of the important ideas that was thrown up was uh, the center periphery uh, uh, dichotomy and uh, how Myanmar is going to deal with that. Uh, what is interesting about this is that uh, there is at the, on the one hand there is a center periphery uh, dichotomy. Uh, Myanmar also has this uh, uh, historical uh, legacy of having the minorities on the periphery and the majority uh, at the center. And uh, this presents a dual dilemma before Myanmar. Uh, how to deal with uh, uh, this problem of having uh, differences between the minority and the majority on the one hand and uh, lack of development at the periphery. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Rahul Mishra tried to address some of these issues by uh, bringing in the stakeholders and uh, he has uh, 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 
try to address some of these uh, problems which Myanmar is facing today. But I think uh, we need to focus on what is the major issue before Myanmar today? Is it the ethnic uh, problem or is it a political issue? Uh, I think uh, uh, perhaps uh, the problem with Myanmar has been that it has not been able to, uh, uh, to address the crux of the problem and the political leaders today in Myanmar have not been able to, uh, uh, to come out in the open and say that uh, the ethnic problem is a major problem. And they have tried to evade, including Aung San Suu Kyi, have tried to evade the real issue at hand. And that perhaps is, uh, uh, is a major problem in Myanmar. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Pulipaka. Um, sir, uh, we all are aware of uh, Ms. Suu Kyi's stance on uh, the Rohingya issue. I would like to know how are the Western countries reacting to her silence. And also, uh, at the beginning of this year or uh, end of last year, I don't remember, but uh, there were some reports of her party accepting uh, election fund kind of things from cloning capitalists who have come under sanctions uh, from the Western countries. So, sir, could you throw some light on this? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this question is for Dr. Sanjay. Uh, sir, you said uh, during your presentation that uh, one of the compelling reasons for the Myanmar military, according to its own admission, is without their presence or without them being at the helm of affairs, the country would disintegrate because of the ethnic conflicts. I would like to know how far there is truth in this, in fact, not just uh, considering the history of uh, Myanmar itself, as well as the, uh, the uh, uh, characteristics of the minorities and their isolation, and considering all these factors, both geographical, historical, and ethnic factors, how far there is truth in this, especially if there were to be a civilian government, how, uh, how will it be different compared to the military? What special reasons or capabilities of military, which it says, have made this possible or uh, have made this uh, 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 made them to climb this in fact thank you very much uh, well uh, there is positivity about the democratic transition in uh, in Myanmar I said that because of the fact that most of this reform uh, issues uh, the reform agenda that has been set is by the government is more or less by the uh, there is no uh, role of the common people of Myanmar in it. So all that they've got is actually they've got in a platter. They're not, uh, they didn't fight for it. I, I'm saying that they didn't fight for it because uh, if you look at uh, the transition from 2000, November 2010 on, uh, there wasn't much, except the, chi the, the Chinese investment issue or uh, the ethnic clashes between uh, ethnic communities. Uh, people didn't protest, people didn't ask for much. So all that they've got is actually given uh, to them without asking for it. Uh, and, and if you look at uh, the transition itself, 2010 elections, uh, we are seeing what is happening in West Asia. Most of the countries, uh, the, there was a regime change and democratic transition, and in name of democracy, we are seeing what is happening there. And the international community has no role to play. So even from March 2011, had Tien Sen uh, uh, not done anything, I mean, rhetorically done a lot of things and not done anything on the ground, uh, international community wouldn't have objected. And the people of Myanmar had to actually wait for another five years, four years. So that's why I'm saying it. On the insurgency front, I think you're, I mean, I agree with you that uh, the insurgent groups, uh, the rebel groups are not particularly happy about it. And uh, they're not positive, certainly not positive about it. And we'll see the uh, uh, implications of that uh, during the elections, uh, how they respond to that. Uh, to uh, Dr. Uday sir's question, uh, uh, well, sir, I agree with you that, uh, I mean, uh, 
that the leadership of Myanmar has not been able to resolve this issue. And this perhaps is the fundamental, I mean, you've, you've actually uh, 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 kind of picked the most important issue that Myanmar uh, policymakers are facing at this moment. Uh, so whether it is the, the ethnic minorities, uh, the rebel groups, or the Rohingyas, uh, both the groups, major groups, uh, including President, have not been able to come out with clear, uh, like their ideas on it, their decisions on it, uh, their uh, policy statements on it. So this is one uh, challenge that Myanmar is facing at this moment. And if they don't resolve it now, uh, five years down the line, this is going to become even more difficult for them, uh, to such an extent that they might have to you know, uh, see a kind of division of, let's say, separate, uh, separatism in the country. Uh, so that's my take on it. You want to respond? Um, well, I can say something on the same question. I think I don't have much to add because I, didn't, I think that's um, correct. And I, th I think the, the problem with people like um, Dosu Thane Sein is that it's just not a priority for them, the ethnic issue is and I don't think it will be a priority until it gets to the point that you just described where it, it, be, it becomes um, such a big problem like the, the movements have gone from separatist ideas to um, more autonomy if that goes back again to the way it was then it becomes a bigger problem maybe they will get more attention uh, in Naypyidaw um, but until then I, I don't think um, any of the big um, players that are also receiving attention internationally. This way it's also not internationally made a priority. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can't add more than that. I totally agree with that. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Uh, uh, regarding Anshuman's question, uh, broadly, we, if you noticed, we have different approaches. I was looking more at it from a systems perspective. She was looking at who is there at the negotiation table and who is not in the stakeholders. And uh, if you take Rahul, he's taking a decision makers, focusing on decision making approach. So therefore, we see a different kind of this thing, whether it is positive, negative, uh, is there an element of, yes, the Myanmar people have paid heavy price for where they are. Should they be satisfied? No. Uh, should they throw up everything and they express discontent? No. Uh, they have made significant progress uh, in terms of uh, at least opening up of political space. I remember going there in 2007 at a dinner table, people used to talk in hush hush voices when they're talking about politics. Today it's much more on the street, uh, which is a positive development in that sense. So it depends upon how you see democracy promotion. Do you see it as a spectacular event uh, accompanied by some fireworks? Yes, no. If you take that approach, we will be disappointed. But if you take more of a, 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 a what's that scholar's name, uh, Stanford, I forgot his name. Uh, if you take a more of an incremental approach where you develop civil society organization, business communities, institutions, then uh, uh, Myanmar is making some progress. Uh, uh, so it depends upon what kind of, whether you take a, an event-based approach or a developmental approach. These are two different things. In some countries, democracy needs, will survive a, a, an event-based approach where it is a spectacular event and it survives. But in Myanmar, that, that may not be the case. So therefore, uh, I would go with Rahul saying that uh, it's, it's a definitely a positive step so far that we have seen. Uh, and in terms of central periphery dichotomy, one quick thing, uh, Myanmar is going to have uh, even more intense debate on this because uh, Professor uh, Kudo's paper talks about how Myan uh, Mandalay and uh, Yangon will emerge as major poles of economic growth. And if that is the case, uh, uh, Burma ethnic group, as a political scientist, uh, in terms of ethnic politics, Burma ethnic group will benefit substantially from uh, 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 ethnic minorities. Uh, so the, there will be even more concentration of power. So far it is political power, now it will be accompanied by economic power uh, of Burma ethnic community. Uh, so that's a political context and we will look forward to his presentation tomorrow. And in terms of uh, uh, insurgency that uh, Dr. Kannan and a couple of other people have asked me whether uh, 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 it is uh, hunger for power or whether it is genuine. Uh, I'm not saying uh, whether it is uh, uh, what I'm trying to understand how Myanmar came. I mean, it's standing where it is standing. Uh, and yes, there will be an element of hunger for power, but the question is, I am trying to unpack the discourse of Myanmar military and trying to see what are the various components of it. Uh, 
Myanmar, if you take Burma, I will use the word Burma, I don't have political connotations when I use Burma and Myanmar, I will use it interchangeably. Uh, during the civilian government, when General Neven was initially asked to take over power in 1958, around that time, he handed back power to civilian government. What is Myanmar military's major concern? Myanmar military's major concern has been that the civilian governments have promised more autonomy than it is required in terms of, say, uh, a, a right to secede. Uh, uh, and therefore they are constantly worried. When UNU came back to power uh, uh, after Neven handed over power, there was a concern in Myanmar military. Legitimate, not legitimate is a different issue. Uh, there was a concern that he was leaning more towards ethnic minorities. Uh, when Myanmar military was constituted, I mean this is the history of that organization, uh, it was constituted from the elements of British army and also from the elements of patriotic Burma force, PBF. So PBF were substantially Burmese, the uh, Burmese uh, British army was substantially ethnic minorities. So the Burmese uh, officers were discriminated, that's the perception. Now Burma's army is substantially Burma, uh, ethnic group. So this complex politics results in that kind of language and that is what I was trying to uh, put in front of you. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi stands on Rohingya, uh, yes, uh, she, uh, she has also pointed out a very important thing. See, this Rohingya issue should not also, or the, um, the Burmese government or the Myanmar government is very uncomfortable with that word, they call it illegal uh, migrants. Uh, uh, that issue is, is now, uh, uh, you are putting Aung San Suu Kyi on block. Uh, whether we like it or not, it is no longer about Rohingyas or the illegal migrants or the boat people. It is, it is a mechanism through which you are trying to put her on block. Uh, and inadvertently, uh, uh, if she speaks on it, she will lose her uh, uh, Burmese vote and if she doesn't come to power, situation will be even worse tomorrow. Uh, so therefore, the, her silence may be strategic and pragmatic. Uh, uh, so, uh, we need not be perturbed that she has uh, given up completely on her uh, democratic credentials. Uh, she has been talking about it in code language, if you, if you noticed. Uh, she said in Washington Post interview very clearly, people are pushing me to, uh, I mean, uh, if you see the language, essentially she is saying is, this is an attempt to take me, asking me to take a stance on it. And the moment I take stance on this way or that way, there is going to be a lot of bloodshed. Uh, so the Western governments, there have been instances when people have expressed displeasure. If you are interested in Rohingyas or the migrant people protecting their interests, uh, the question is not whether to make Aung San Suu Kyi speak or not. Let us assume she speaks, situation does not improve, what's the point? You have a moral victory, but in terms of real politics, you may have lost it. Uh, so that's the uh, dimensions that need to be kept in mind, especially during an election season when rhetoric, all kinds of rhetoric get circulated. Uh, so those are some of the issues on corny capitalists taking money. Uh, I, I haven't gone through the list of uh, I mean, uh, that specific news item, uh, that's a challenge. Uh, democracy is exceptionally costly, trust me, it requires funding. And when we talk of political transitions, uh, or even in our own country, we don't talk of state funding. Now, in a country like Burma, where it is going through political transition, where military has substantial uh, resources at its disposal, Aung San Suu Kyi has to raise funds to fight elections in some form or the other. How will she raise it? That's a challenge. Uh, and she may make mistakes, I'm not saying she may not make mistakes, but the question is, without state funding, even in countries like India, how can you have clean politics? Uh, hobnobbing with some capitalists will take place. That doesn't mean that uh, the people who are doing it are bad people. That's the nature of politics across countries that is happening. Tragic, but that's how it is. Thank you very much. Uh, also, I see that uh, there are still some more questions. I think we have run out of time and the, uh, the organizers would really like to end this session. But before ending, I think we should all give a round of applause for, for the three very good presentations. Uh, very beautifully, and he should be given a round of applause for that also.